All right, if you've got your Bibles, you want to be open to Ecclesiastes, the fourth chapter, and then uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm excited about this message, but I'm also a little apprehensive, uh, so let's pray about it. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share from your word, and I pray right now that um, uh, the spirit in which all of these things are said this morning would reflect your spirit, that it would be said in a, uh, in a way that doesn't come across as offensive or condescending or accusatory, Father, but that you, would, uh, that you would speak through me and say the things that you want to say to your body that is here in this place. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So next week, uh, like um, I think Dave said at the beginning, we're going to have a uh, guest here, Kyle said it, uh, from, from the choirs at Eastern. It's going to be, uh, to me, it's going to be a great topic. Is this thing on? Yeah, there it is. It's going to be a great topic uh, that has to do with where our culture is. We are going to be in the Word, but I am going to spend probably a larger amount of time than normal uh, dissecting the culture that we're living in when it comes to this question, because this is a big thing in our world today. What is our identity? How do we identify ourselves? What makes Christians different in the way that we uh, form and shape our identity? That'll be next week. These are the questions to think about. What is it that shapes our identity? Uh, that's one of the things that I want you to, to consider next week. Also, how do we understand, how do we define ourselves? And the two passages that I want you to look at for next week, Jeremiah chapter 31 and Ephesians, the first chapter. Those are the two that I want you to take a look at for next week as we dive into this question. Okay, so as I was getting this message ready, this question about the church, and, and uh, you, you read what the point is of what we're doing here. Is this thing dying? Because I'm trying desperately to get it to click, and it's not. There we go. I thought about this, and I don't know, um, I don't know that I'm completely accurate in this, but I feel like I am. I feel like I got my finger firmly on the pulse of what's happening in our culture today, and I'm sure you all uh, think the same way about me. I truly do think these batteries are dying. Do we have like AAA batteries? Are there AAA batteries back there, Brandon? Is Brandon even there? Brandon is left again. Every time I need Brandon, he's gone. If there's AAAs, give them to me because this is going to get really boring if I have to keep walking back here to fill up the screen like this. Anyway, what is happening? All right. Uh, if you conducted a poll, all right, let's just imagine that we conducted a poll uh, going out there and asked people, what do you think the church is? How are they going to describe it? Now, I can't prove this to you, but this is what I honestly believe. I think that some people would say that the church is like a social club. It's where people come together who are like-minded. They have similar beliefs. They're going to get together. They're going to meet, and they're going to talk about things. I think that's what some people would say ultimately the church is. I think some people would say it's an organization that exists to help you raise your children. And that's why people come to church. They bring their kids because they want their kids to learn good moral lessons. That's why they come here, okay? I think that other people would see the church as an institution for self-help. Even if they don't say that that's what they think the church is, that's how they're going to behave. That's how they're going to act. They go through a tough time in their life. They lose a family member. Or they go through a divorce. That's when they're going to go to church. Because the church is going to help me get through this difficult time. It's maybe a political operation. Sadly, I think a large majority of people are coming to see the church in that light. A political operation that exists to advance the ideas and the culture of the Republican Party because that's going to save our culture. Or other more progressive churches, it's an organization that's going to advance the ideals of the Democrat Party to be able to save our culture from a position of social justice, all of these things. And I think... Some of you might feel similarly. If we really boiled it down to what you believe, I think that at your heart of hearts, you might in fact believe this way as well. But remember what it is that we're wanting to do as I slowly walk across the stage, nonchalantly, you have no idea what I'm doing right now, fix it. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I honestly think that um, if you consider what it is that we're wanting to do, as I slip behind the screen, this is just so smooth, isn't it? It's just a glorious presentation. We're wanting to think like Jesus, right? That's what this whole series is about. So I think that we ought to think about the church as Jesus thought about the church. Well done. Easy handoff. Nobody knows. Look at that. You saw some of that in the answer. You saw some of the answers to that question, what Jesus thinks, in the reading for this week. Okay, and we're going to get into that in one second. But I think beyond that, Paul actually answers the question, what the church is, in his letter to Timothy, his first letter to Timothy, there's a couple verses in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy that I think if anybody ever asks you, what is the church, it's going to answer that question. And I found this later this week as I was studying and preparing the message. Otherwise, I would have made this the reading for the week. This is what he says. 
Although I hope to come to you soon, Paul's wanting to come to Timothy, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's family, which is the assembly of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. All right, I don't know if you caught it there, but right there in front of you, there are three metaphors that Paul gives to perfectly define what the church is. I'm highlighting them for you right there. What is the church? It is God's family. It is the assembly, the gathering of the living God, and it's the pillar or the foundation of the truth. That right there, come back to me, that right there is the church. That's what the church is. If anybody ever asks you, what is the church? It's God's family. It's the assembly of the living God. Remember who's writing this. Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy is in Ephesus. Ephesus, there's a small little congregation of believers, and everybody around them is worshiping uh, statues. They're worshiping Diana, just like these stone rocks is what they're worshiping. And, and Paul is saying, we are worshiping a living God, and we're, we are the pillar and the foundation of the truth. So let's peel each of these back. Let's look deeper into these, these three analogies, God's family, the assembly of the living God, and the pillar and the foundation of the truth. All right. God's family. We see this reflected throughout Scripture. At least you should. We did a whole message on God being the Father. And in Romans 8, we read that Jesus is like our brother. It's this family analogy that you see without Scripture. But what should that tell us about how we treat each other in the local body, in the local gathering, in the local church? I want you to think to the reading from this week. Okay, Go to Ecclesiastes. You read this this week. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and look at verse 8. Look at what's happening to this guy. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no one to end his toil, no one to bear his burdens. His eyes were not content with his wealth. There was really no point. For, wh for whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This, too, is meaningless, a miserable business. So here's a guy without any family to participate in the activities of life with, nobody to share these things with, and I start wondering, do we feel the same way in the church? that we're toiling alone? Do we share our problems and hardships together? Or do we just come together once a week and say hi, and we're here to get something out of it for ourselves? Do we bear each other's burdens, the burdens that one another are carrying? Do we work hard to reconcile our conflicts, or do we just avoid one another? There's somebody in the church I don't get along with, so I'm not going to go to that church, or if I do, I'm going to sit on the other side. of the We don't really work to re reconcile the conflicts. Do we have the best interest for each other in mind? Do we defend each other when each other come under attack from the world, it's like the kid phenomenon. If you've had children, you know what I'm talking about. We see this. Our kids will fight like cats and dogs. Our kids can despise each other, and they, and they are furious with one another. One will go into the room, and they'll slam the door. We have to tell them that you can't say this, but I hate you. And why do they hate each other? Well, you took the Barbie. You tore the Barbie clothes. That's why you hate each other. You don't hate each other. But here's what's amazing. When they go to school... These two people that just can't stand each other at home, man, if somebody else starts picking on one of them, oh, no, no. I can hate them, but you're not going to hate them. You're not going to talk to, the, to them like that. That's not going to happen. Is that the way the church is, that we may have bickering and fighting and, and, and struggles that we try to reconcile within the body, but if the world attacks one of them, we're going to come to their defense. Is this us? Or are we more like this guy from Ecclesiastes, uh, the fourth chapter? Do you know what helps with this? Um, I, we heard it in the prayer this morning, and we heard it in Terry's prayer request, and Paul echoes it in Romans chapter 12, and I think sometimes we overlook it. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. You notice how we're referring to fellow Christians. I think adopting this language is beneficial. If you're referring to someone else in the body of Christ, either here in this body or outside in a different congregation, as your brother or sister in Christ, it's going to change the way that you are dealing with them, even when there is conflict. And it's also helpful to remember family dynamics. When you're and what makes a family useful? Not everyone in the church needs to think like me. Our family growing up, my mom and dad were not at all the same. If you know Bill and Lisa, you know that they are two very different individuals. My dad is the intellectual who never stopped going to school. You've heard his, his uh, communion meditations before. You get halfway through, you've got the dictionary, the thesaurus, and then you're like, ah, forget it. I'll just wait till next week when Ben gets up here and talks like a second grader. That'll be a lot easier <laughs> to understand. I say that because Ben's on the marriage retreat. Anyway... <laughs> 
so th- my dad, that was him. And then my mom wore her heart on her sleeve and she was very emotional about things. They're two very different people. Mom didn't try to change dad to be more like her. And dad didn't try to change mom to be more like him as if one of them was better than the other. And that worked really well. Why? Well, when I was growing up and I would fall down and get a boo-boo, what did I need? I needed the love and the care of my mom, the nurturing side of her, to kiss it and make it better. What did I not need? I did not need a 40-minute dissertation on the purposes of human suffering from my father. Oh, uh, well, son, as you can tell, this is a compound fracture, and we understand the way this is. Just give me a tourniquet, Dad. Anyway, I didn't need that. Now, as I've gotten older and people have said nasty things about me because of my beliefs, what have I needed? I've needed my dad's sound and his counsel and his wisdom to explain those things to me. What I have not needed, one of the most horrifying moments of my life. I wrote a piece for the Indy Star. This has been years ago. And the USA Today that owns the Indy Star picked it up and ran it in there. I, it was great. And then I started reading the comment section. And people think I'm an idiot. It's fantastic. I'm just reading all of these things about how horrible I am. And I get like 20 comments down and there it is. Lisa Heck has waded into the comment section. And she's defending me. You don't know him. You don't know anything about him. It's like, I'm 40 years old. Mom, stay off of Facebook, right? That's what I did not need. I don't need Mama Bear Claws coming out to rip the face off of anybody that says something mean about me. That balance was effective. And it's effective in the church as well. There are people who come from a different perspective in the belief system who are far more effective at reaching a certain sector of the population than others of us. Don't try to change other believers to be exactly like you. Different mixes in the family, right? But the goal remains the same. And we want to maximize the gifts of the individuals. And that should sound really familiar. It should. It's the very reality that Jesus envisioned for his church. Flip over to 1 Corinthians where you saw this. We'll start in verse 7. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy. To another distinguishing between spirits. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he gives them to each one just as he determines. Are you seeing that's exactly what Jesus is envisioning for his church right there in that passage? Different gifts, different perspectives, but the same spirit that is driving us towards the same ultimate goal that we have in building his kingdom. But it's more than just familial love. It's more than just loving one another in the body, right? You understand this about families. Families also prioritize one another. We care about our family members in a more dynamic and personal way than we care about others who are outside of our family. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's not. It may seem like there is, but there's not. I think back to uh, when I was growing up and I went to college. My financial need in college was a priority to my parents. My friends, Jeff Steiner and Keith Parker, their financial needs were not a priority to my parents. My parents said, let them pay for their own college. My priority is with you, right? And nobody says, well, that's not right of your parents to do that. No, we understand. Families will prioritize one another. My mom and dad, I watched them take on the role of caring for their mom and dad as they got older. It's what we were talking about, Bill Schaefer and Linda, caring for the elderly in their own family. Now, they're not caring for the people on the other side of town the exact same way as they get older. And we don't say, well, that's not right of them. We understand families will prioritize one another. Exactly. That's exactly the way Christ expected us to act as the church. I know that seems weird, but we are to prioritize one another. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Of course we want to do good to all people, but especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Especially to those gathered here. It's what separates us, the way that we care for one another. It's what makes us more than just a social club. Look, you prioritize your family, whether you realize it or not. You eat meals with them not other people, except on special occasions. You go to dinners, you complete tasks as a family, you take trips, you go on vacations. And Jesus is saying that's the exact same thing that I want for my family in the church. You understand that, right? That we do these things as well. You worship together, you do Bible studies together, you have small groups together, you fellowship together, you take retreats together, like a posse that is up there working on their marriages this weekend, right? And and mission trips, we do all of these things together. You prioritize your family. 
If one of them in the family has a physical need or an emotional need or a financial need, you meet it, right? And Jesus is saying that's the exact same thing that you are doing here in the body of Christ. What is going on with this thing? It's freaking out on me that if somebody has a physical or an emotional or a spiritual need, financial need, you meet it here. Look, we have a benevolence ministry. And of course, our benevolence ministry tries to care for people outside of our body. But the main point of the benevolence ministry is when one of the brothers or sisters within the body is struggling, we meet that need. That's our priority. It's what we're supposed to be doing. And that's why I have to take a quick side note. I didn't know, uh, this has been something that's been bothering me for, for some period of time. And I thought, well, it kind of fits. Maybe I don't have time for this. But I feel like it wouldn't be weighing on my mind if I shouldn't share this. You do not air your family's dirty laundry. Right? You don't go out and fan the flames of the struggles that your brother or your sister or your mom or dad are having. That's handled in-house. That's an expectation for family behavior. And Jesus prayed fervently that his church, his family, be the exact same way. That we would exhibit unity and love. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you will love one another. Stop for a second. You know how Jesus loved you. He gave himself up for you. And he is saying the same way that I love you, you are to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm telling you, I don't see that in, in Christianity in America today. You know what I see? I see Christians doing their best to show the world how they're the real Christians, but these other people are the bad Christians. Those people, they don't understand it, but I'm the good Christian. Trying to curry favor with the world by pointing out how awful those Christians are over there. That is not what you and I are called to do. Jesus says, by this, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you want, if you love one another. Now, we take this verse out of context all the time. You'll hear people say, well, the world will know that we're Christians by the way that we love our fellow man, by the way we're digging wells in the third world, and the way that we're building the rescue missions and the orphanages and all of that, and all of that we should be doing, but that is not what this verse is saying. Jesus is saying the world will know that you all are my disciples by the way that you love each other. It's a familial love that you have for people who are not your biological family. And that's going to demonstrate to the world there's something different about these people. These people love one another as a family, the family of God. That's the point that he's getting across. So if that's the case, any guesses what Satan's play is going to be on this? If this is what Jesus says, the world will know you're my disciples if you love one another, how is Satan going to play this? Well, you should know Satan's play is going to be to divide the church. His effort is going to be to divide the kingdom of God. And you see this from the very beginning of the church. Back in the book of Acts, where you're reading about the, the early days of the church, you see what Satan is doing. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing... The Hellenistic Jews, among them, complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. There was favoritism that was happening in the church. Hey, we weren't favoring all people together as the family of God. So there is division. You can see Satan's hand at work trying to corrupt the work of the church, and then it shows up in Corinth. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and he warns them. He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Peter. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Look, this is what Satan does. And he's done it from the pages of Scripture to the pages of history today. He is attempting to divide the body of Christ. Every page you turn to, it's the same strategy. It's the same attempt. It's the same move of Satan. Divide the body of Christ. And my question is, are we allowing him to do that very thing to us? I think sadly, in many ways, he is successful in that regard. And it causes big problems in the long run. It's the history of the church. Wherever you go back through the pages of history, and whenever there is some significant disagreement, you'll see the church divide, and it will turn on itself. It'll start eating itself alive. You'll have one group of Christians call another group of Christians heretics. 
And another group of Christians calls this group of Christians apostates. We turn on each other and we tear each other up. And honestly, if you go back into older history than what we're living today, you will see Christians actually uh, killing one another. Okay, Christian blood being shed by other Christians. Now, I don't think that's as, as common today as what it used to be. But go online. I mean, it's unbelievable. I started, uh, when I kind of made my transition away from the nonsense of politics, even though I still write about it, and started following more of the theological world, I, I follow people on, on the progressive side of Christianity to get a different perspective, and I follow people on this side. Man, Christian Twitter is one of the most vile, awful places that you can ever imagine. I mean, if you want to think about, we talk about how our political dialogue is so rancorous. I mean, it doesn't hold a candle to what I see in Christian Twitter. It's terrible. And our accusations bear down heavier. We're not just calling someone ignorant. We're not just calling someone bigoted. We're saying you're leading people to hell. You're a child of the devil is what you are. It's a very harsh place. And my question is, how does that comport with the world knowing us by the way that we love one another? I don't think that's the message that they're going to be getting when they see us acting that way and hurling those accusations. Again, that's a personal conviction that I have as I watch all of this. Loving each other, let me point this out, loving each other does not mean we have to agree. In families, we love each other, but we don't agree about everything. I love my wife, but she is totally wrong on the optimal home temperature. She believes, this is so wild, she thinks that the optimal home temperature is to have it uh, where you can survive but also hang raw meat on hooks and it not go bad. She believes that that's the, uh, she's wrong about that, but I still love her. And my brother, Andrew, uh, that, that song, Turn the Page, that Bob Seger wrote, that Metallica did a cover of, I've told him Metallica's version is better than the original Bob Seger version, and he says it's not. He's clearly wrong. You know that and I know that. But, but that doesn't... Oh, quit your murmuring. What is wrong with you? It is better. But anyway, uh, he, I still love him. And I look at my sister, Katie. Katie's wrong about everything. But we still love her. Okay? It doesn't mean just because somebody's wrong about something that you have to stop loving them or you have to get rid of them. Well, fellow Christians are wrong about some important stuff. We're not all going to agree on interpretations of passages and understandings of things. They are fellow Christians, and they may be wrong on important stuff, but they still love the Lord. Their motivations are largely pure, and they're to serve Him, which means we have a deference. We should give to them. We should love and respect them. It doesn't mean we have to agree with them. It doesn't mean we do not rebuke them if we think that they're in disobedience to the Scripture. But we should be humble enough to listen to what they have to say. We should be humble enough to acknowledge that you know, we don't know everything and maybe we're not completely right. We're wrong ourselves. We should also affectionately unite in the things that we do agree with for the greater good of the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus is praying for so fervently. And, and, and I'll tell you, on more than one occasion, I'll be online and I'll see these two Christians going at it. And, and it turns bitter. I mean, it gets ugly is what it does. There's all kinds of personal and deeply offensive accusations. And because of my nature, I don't like this, but my nature is I want to get involved in that. Because I see who's right, and I see who's wrong, and I want to weigh in. But uh, hopefully, this is part of Christian maturity, that I'm growing and I'm getting better about this. And I'm realizing both of these individuals involved in this equation are my brothers, and I want to be a peacemaker as much as possible. You know what Jesus says about peacemakers. I want to heal division. And sometimes healing division means not taking sides in those situations as much as we may be inclined to do so. Look, I'm not perfect, but here's where I am. I am convinced that the church of Jesus, more than anything else right now in American culture, needs to resolve this way. I will not be part of Satan's agenda to harm the church. I won't do it. I'm not going to turn on my fellow brother or sister. Will I rebuke them? Will I go through biblical ways of approaching them and dealing with them on things that I absolutely I will, but I will not be a tool that Satan uses to harm the church. Secondly, we're told we're the assembly of the living God. What does that mean, the assembly of the living God? We are called to worship a living and a holy and an active God. And we're to obey him. Something happens here when we gather. Something that the world is not going to fully understand. Something happens here. I want you to remember what Jesus taught. Look in Matthew 18. This is what he says. He says, For where two or three gather in my name, 
There am I with them. When, when we gather here, Jesus, the Father, they are present in our midst. And Paul will go on and he'll expound upon this mystery himself. You'll read this in 1 Corinthians. He'll say this, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? He is here with us when we gather. We gather because what? Because God meets with us in a special way when we do. And I'll tell you, unbelievers will notice. Not all of them. And they're not going to make comment about it. But you will hear it from time to time. There was something different there. There was the spirit. And they don't know what it is, but we know what it is. Also, gathering together reminds us of our need to be holy. I've always wondered how a passage like I'm about to show you could ever be worked into a sermon. And we're doing it this morning, baby. This is one of the greatest things that you're ever going to see. We're going back to the book of Deuteronomy. How in the world can a preacher ever use this passage? One of the single greatest passages of Scripture, in my humble estimation, it happens in Deuteronomy, the 23rd chapter. Let's read this together, shall we? Designate a place outside, not out loud. No, 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 sorry. I'll read it. Don't you walk on my, this is my thunder here, okay? Designate a place outside the camp where you can go to relieve yourself. As part of your equipment, have something to dig with, and when you relieve yourself, dig a hole and cover up your excrement. For the Lord your God, it's just great, for the Lord your God moves about in your camp to protect you and to deliver your enemies to you. Your camp must be holy so that he will not see among you anything indecent and turn away from you. I bet you didn't know that there was a passage in Scripture on proper sanitation habits, right? Dig a hole and then cover that stuff up. God doesn't want to see it. That's what they're being told. All right, how do you make that into a message that we can understand? We've got toilets. How about this? How about we do our best to rid ourselves of all sin and moral filth that would dishonor God in this place? How about when we come together, we recognize there is a holiness that we are to be about, that is to define us, that is to separate us. Also, I want you to look at this. There's another reason from the reading. Go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and look at verses 9 through 12. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. The scriptural expectation that you and I gather here physically together, that's not hidden. It's not random. It's not just a mere suggestion. And you're seeing why right there. It's designed for our spiritual protection. Right? It's not for the, the arrogance of the church leadership so that they know and they can show their attendance numbers. It's not for any reason other than this right here. Your spiritual protection. That's why you are told to gather here. Because this is where we learn to be driven towards holiness and to live righteously. If you wonder why, Peter explains it. Look at this passage. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And who is he going to go after? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, and a cord of three strands is not easily broken. I'll tell you who he's going to go after. You know this. You've seen enough of the, of the nature channel to know exactly how this plays out. Yes? Of course you do. We talked about Satan and the way he operates. Even if you've never encountered Satan yourself, because he can only be in one place at one time, he's got an agent, an angel, a demon working on your case right now. And the void, you, you've seen it, the gazelle that wanders from the pack. You're watching the Nature Channel and the little lions laying in the grass, and there goes the little gazelle, and you're like, no, don't go that way. And then you hear the little voiceover that says, sadly, there can be but one outcome. And then, <gasps> and then it's all over for the gazelle, right? The lion is waiting to pounce on the one that leaves the pack. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching, Christ is teaching, this is a very practical lesson, that we stir up godly living by being here, by being around these people. Stop and think about the New Testament. You read the New Testament. What is the New Testament? Well, you've got the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you've got a book after that that's about the early exploits of the church, the book of Acts. And then what's the rest of it? You know what the rest of that is? The rest of the New Testament? They're letters, that's what the New Testament is, letters written by the apostles. 
But these are not letters written to specific individuals only. It's not a letter that's written to you as an individual or to me as an individual. And these are not letters that are written to uh, large generic bodies of believers. That's not what this is. These are letters that are written to church congregations in Ephesus, in Coloss, uh, in, in Galatia. They're written to the Corinth, the church in Corinth, the church in Rome. These are written letters to a specific congregation of people. The entirety of the New Testament are directions. How can you follow the teachings of the New Testament if you are not in concert with a body of believers when the lessons of the New Testament and the teachings are about how we function in concert with a body of believers. It's one of the most astounding things. Look at what we're told. Love one another. Welcome one another. Care for... How are you going to do that if you're isolated? You can't. Agree with one another. Bear one another's burdens. Forgive one another. Teach one another. And it goes on from there. There's three more that will pop up here. What do we do? We do good to one another. We confess to one another. We show hospitality towards one another. Those are the teachings of the New Testament. How do you obey your commands as a New Testament Christian if you are not gathering with the local body? Legitimate question. And I'm not saying that to be personally offensive to anybody, but it's a legitimate question. How can you obey the New Testament if you don't gather with the local body and the local church? And so much of the New Testament becomes void if you're not doing that. Here's the problem, and this isn't anybody's problem. It's a cultural problem that we have. We have a tendency to think that the value of church is what's happening right now. We have a tendency to think that the point of church, why you come to church, is to hear a lesson from the preacher that will make me a better person. That's what we have come to believe. It's part cultural. We tend to think that the church is a product or an event. And I'm not saying that in an accusatory way because I have come to think of it that way too over the years because that's what you do. You show up on Sunday, you see the show, you hopefully get something out of it, and then you go through your week. That's how we've come to understand the church. The church is going to hear a sermon or sing some songs and hear a sermon, right? That's how we understand it. So then the logical question becomes, if that's what it is, isn't a digital version sufficient? I mean, if all it is is a show... Can't I just watch it from home? I can see the show from home, right? Some of us go to football games, but more often we prefer to watch it from our living room because the couch is more comfortable. You can watch a show from home. Isn't the digital version just as sufficient as actually being there? If it's a weekly show, why not sit at home in our sweatpants and watch it take place? Fair. But if, if the church is not a show or a product, if the church is a family gathering, then watching from your living room or your bedroom should leave you feeling empty. Thanksgiving dinner with your family. You tune in on television and watch everybody else argue together around the table? No! I'm using a bad example because some of you would prefer to stay at home on family uh, gatherings. But you get my point. If this is a gathering of the family, you should feel empty. Now listen, this is a very important thing to note. There are times where we have to love one another and obey those commands from a distance. When there's bad weather, we sometimes cancel services. Why? Because we know that the very people who should stay home because it's not safe for them to get out will be the ones who faithfully will get out and try to make it to church that day. So to care for the body, sometimes we have to love from a distance. We just went through that time. Nobody knew what was going to go on with COVID. Nobody knew how serious and how easily it would spread. And so we canceled services for a while and we did it from home. There are times that you have to love and obey that from a distance. But when we can gather, we should gather. Think of it this way. An analogy will help. Um, a husband and a wife separated by war. Okay? Uh, the husband goes off to war, the wife stays home, or in our day, the wife might go off to war and the husband stay home. When they are separated by war, they cannot be together. Their relationship, they can't love one another and care for one another the way that they're supposed to because they're separated necessarily by distance, and so they're forced to carry on their relationship by writing letters or by writing emails. All right, we all understand that. That's fair. Nobody questions it. But once the war is over, are that husband and wife going to be satisfied to continue just corresponding by letters? or emails, what would you think of their relationship if after the war and they could be back together, they said, Dah, I think I'll just email her. I mean, you're not going to think that that's a very, strong mess or a very strong relationship, right? Well, that's kind of the point. There are times that we can't be together, but when we can, if we decide to mail it in, ah, just watch on television, what does that signify about the importance that we're placing on the family of God? It's answering the question pretty, pretty plainly. 
without gathering, obeying those commands that I showed you that we are to obey as a church, it becomes like writing letters in a war. And once the war is over, we should gather. Now listen, there are people who are shut in, and I need to speak to this. Those people who are shut in cannot be here. That's why the work that Steve Wright and, and that ministry does is so important. We're bringing the body of Christ to them. And that is so critical because we have that need for the family of God. But can I tell you something about those shut-ins? I don't think you will find a single one of them that wouldn't give anything to be able to gather here. And yet those of us who can take it for granted so often. That isn't the way the body of Christ is to function. Finally, let me hit this one quickly. The pillar and the foundation of the truth. That's what, that's what Paul writes and tells Timothy that we're to be. The pillar and the foundation of the truth. I'm going to chuck this thing in the trash when the day's over. I just want you to know that. All right. Jesus instituted his church as the single force holding forth truth in a day that people are going to reject it. The, the people are going to reject the truth and I need my church to proclaim it. And there's something else here too. Did you see in that passage where he called the church the foundation of the truth? Now that's weird because in Ephesians he writes to the church there, what? That the truth is the foundation of the church. Okay? So he's saying here to Timothy that the church is the foundation of the truth. But then he writes to the church in Ephesus that the truth is the foundation of the church. Did I say that the same way twice? No, I said it the, yeah, I said it the right way. It's fine. Quit judging me. All right, anyway, the church and the truth then need one another. I want you to hear that again. The church of God and the truth of God need one another. In what way? Well, in this way. The church needs the truth. How? The church is dependent on the truth for its existence. That's how. I'll say that again. The church depends on the truth of God for its existence. If this wasn't real, why would we gather? Why would we be here? We depend on the truth of God for our very existence. But the truth depends on the church for what? For its defense and its proclamation. If no one is standing on this word and preaching it and proclaiming it, then the truth goes nowhere. God's designed his truth to be the foundation of who and what we are. And he has designed us, the church, to be the proclaimers and the defenders of that very truth. So let's wrap this up. Ah, let's wrap this up this way. I don't have to convince you that you live in a post-truth society. You know that, right? If you don't, just open your eyes. Everybody does what is right in their own eyes. We obey our own personal whims, and that's why we're here. Let me show you how Paul fin finishes that passage. I read you 14 and 15 as he's writing to Timothy. I want you to look at what he says in verse 16. What is it that we defend and we proclaim to the world that truth? Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He, Jesus, appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. That, friends, that right there, that is what we proclaim to a lost and a dying world. That is the truth upon which we rely, and God has designed us to preach it to a world that needs it. Father, I thank you for your word, your word that teaches us, your word that corrects us, that rebukes us, but also motivates and encourages us. Father, I pray for those of us that have come to see church as a show or a product. We've been forsaking the assembly perhaps because we haven't really realized its purpose, that we are a family to care for one another, to use our gifts to serve one another, to encourage one another in all good and righteous things, to spur one another on to purity. Father, we need each other, and you have so wisely designed this body for that purpose. So I pray for us as we continue our daily lives not to look at church as a mere obligation, not to look at church as just a, a box to check off at the end of the week, but that we see it as the living assembly of the living God and that we would take joy in participating in it and building up your kingdom. Father, I pray for um, those that have not yet been impacted by your truth, that you have designed us as a body to go out and reach them by unashamedly proclaiming your truth, regardless of what they say or do, regardless of whether they reject us as they rejected your son or not, you've given us the privilege to speak your name and to teach your wisdom. 
May we be encouraged and motivated to do that very thing until you call us home. This is our prayer. We ask it in the name above every other name, the name of Jesus Christ, the foundation of the church, and everyone said, amen. amen. You want to join our church body. Now's a great time to do it. If you'd come forward as we stand and sing, maybe you want to join the body of Christ in general and be baptized into him and, and, and confess your sins. Now's the time to do it. Maybe you need prayer in your life. David's going into room number eight. You don't want to come forward. You don't want to make a big deal out of it, but there's something that you're struggling with. That's why we exist, to build one another up, to bear each other's burdens. Happy to meet with you in room eight. Just make that decision as you need to now as we stand and as we sing. Uh.